We're uh, going to continue our uh, series of lessons uh, on pillars of the Christian uh, faith, pillars of Christian character, and this week we're going to talk about growth. Growth, very important. Can't have life without growth. That's uh, very important. In fact, uh, it has been said that life is, by its very definition, a growth process, and we know that in our own lives. It's also true to say that spiritual growth is a life process, uh, a characteristic of everyone who's in the body of Christ. And that tells us that this is very important uh, in terms of a pillar of Christian character. If you have your Bibles with you, could you turn to 2 Peter 3? 2 Peter chapter 3 and um, verse, let's see, 18. 2 Peter 3.18. This is the very end of uh, Peter's second letter, the last writing uh, he ever contributed by God's grace. And he closes this letter with a benediction, which speaks to our topic today. He says in verse 18... Like very good. He's already causing trouble back there, isn't he? Your dad. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Dad's like, I'm innocent in all of this. Look at me. That's that guy on the end over there. <laughs> Verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So Peter really commands in kind of this benediction all believers to grow. Notice there's our word in the grace and knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, if you just left it there, God said, grow. And you had to figure that all out on your own, uh, provide your own growing resources, we would be in trouble. But the good news is, is we're not really left to our own to figure out how to grow. God gives us resources. And as we look into God's word together, God through the Holy Spirit causes us to grow in an ever increasing kind of maturity towards Christ's likeness. That is the goal. And so in order to get our minds wrapped around this, I want to invite you to turn over, not too far now, just to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 12 through 14. 12 through 14. You see, uh, just from that one verse, we could look at many of them, but there's a command that all believers grow spiritually in uh, Christ's likeness. That's very straightforward. But I want you to notice how it is we are to grow. How is it that we are going to develop? And here we have uh, John, the last living apostle at the time uh, of the writing of this, uh, likely. Uh, who gives us a, a sense of how we're to grow in levels of maturity. He says in verse 12 there, 1 John 2, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I want to suggest to you this morning this passage is helpful for our topic because it really does reveal uh, three kind of basic stages of spiritual growth. You'll notice he mentions children in verses 12 and 13. In fact, John refers to kind of a a subcategory of believers here, and he uses a word that means spiritual infants. That's the word that we get translated in our English as children. And then notice John mentions two more, we might call them advanced levels of development. He uses the phrase young men and fathers. And what I'd like to do for just a little bit is to kind of to break these three down. What does it look like for us to proceed through the level of spiritual infants to become young men and women of the faith, so to speak, and then to reach that uh, 
kind of level of maturity that John is talking about when he mentions fathers? Well, let's break it down just a bit and figure out what exactly we mean by growth through these stages. First off, let's talk about spiritual infancy, spiritual infancy. I know uh, for some of you, you haven't had infants in the house for a while. It's been a little while for me, but not that long ago, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, Abram was a bit of a surprise in our family, but we are going to have an infant again, and that was fine. He, one of the best kind of surprises in this world are babies. But of course, we all remember uh, perhaps what that's like, and as any parent would attest, one truism of infants and little children is the lack of discernment about what is or what isn't good for them. This time of year when there's a lot of candy around in the world, uh, kids going door to door and getting that candy, I always kind of don't look forward to this because uh, both Trinity and Abram would like to, if possible, eat nothing but candy for the month of October. And uh, it's difficult to keep it out of the house and if it was up to them, per their discernment, they would just eat chocolate bars all of the time. Well, spiritual infants struggle in some ways with the same things, right? Either new believers or immature Christians, they lack discernment. And when anyone's still struggling in spiritual infancy, and I would say that's true of anybody who's a new convert, that's not a negative thing. It's not an insult in any way. But if somebody's new in Christ, there's a lot to learn. You have to start studying God's Word and get a Christian worldview in place. And that can really take years. It can take years even to come to a knowledge of God's Word, even though I believe the Holy Spirit does give that believer new resources. The spiritual man, as Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, has the ability to understand the things of God. But at the beginning, it's a little bit dicey, isn't it? It's a little bit of a dangerous time. But we know by God's grace... As spiritual infants begin through study, through participation in church, through the preaching of God's word, learning how to pray, etc., they begin to deepen their knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? This is the point uh, of verse 13. And what happens is they eventually progress from kind of a, a childish level of understanding through to a greater level of maturity. In fact, this is one of the reasons why it's so vital it's so very important that new Christians be integrated into the life of a strong church, a church where God's word is honored, where they will be fed from the word and protected from potential spiritual harm. I think one of the most dangerous times in the life of a Christian is right at the beginning, near conversion, because all of the old relationships that they have and friendships, all of the old patterns of behavior itself, they're still in place, aren't they? And oftentimes what happens is some of the greatest spiritual uh, warfare takes place at that time. And that's a very dangerous thing because these spiritual infants, they don't have a lot that they can really use to discern of how to face that thing. And so the dominant negative characteristic, we might say, from this letter is lack of discernment. But notice in verse 13, John does identify a very positive characteristic. He says, I have written to you children because, notice, you know whom? You know the Father. The Father. The new believer knows the Lord is his source of joy and blessing in that new Christian life. And so to rejoice in a basic knowledge of Jesus' love, that's a wonderful starting place for God's children. It's a wonderful place to be, and yet they can't stay there. <laughs> they all need to press on to the goal, right, towards Christ-likeness. There's an expectation of growth. You know, if uh, Trinity over the next year didn't grow at all, uh, didn't seem to show any development, I would rush her to the doctor. I would be scared that she wasn't growing properly. Maybe there was a disease uh, there. Same thing in the Christian life. Expectation will grow. Yeah, without a doubt, for sure. Yeah, I hear several really uh, gems in what you just said, uh, Carl. Um, training, uh, teaching and discernment. Uh, I think about 
our recent uh, evangelism seminar where the Great Commission's broken down into those who can be bringers, teachers, and keepers. A keeper's role would certainly fall uh, into this particular need, right? That somebody could uh, do one-on-one -on -one discipleship, uh, be a sounding board. You know, I think about my own kids growing up in the world where we've had to teach them discernment and other things so they can progress. That's a lot of one-on-one -on -one work, you know? A lot of character training, a lot of picking how to choose battles, what to separate from, what not to separate from, and boy, that's just the first 18 years. And then, as I'm learning now, because of my oldest son, it gets really interesting then, because you become the parent of an adult, and the discipleship needs are, in many ways, even greater. You know, I used to think, well, there can't be anything greater than trying to keep a child alive. That must be the biggest and hardest thing. <laughs> That's not the hardest thing. It's a thing, but it's not the hardest necessarily. Yeah, and that, you know, that's another great point. I was thinking about what Carl said, just the, the gift of the church, right? That the church becomes a community of um, uh, discipleship, like a discipleship school, and um, uh, is equipped with people with different giftings uh, to do the, the work. Ideally, you have strong pastoral care in a church. I know that's always a struggle, particularly it feels like these days people are busier than ever, but, but yeah, um, what I hear you saying, Laura, is a, a, an understanding that when you are an instrument that God uses to lead somebody to Christ, then there's a responsibility to maintain discipleship after. It's, it's not a, oh, you're saved and the work is done kind of thing. It, come to church and blend in and then things will be good. Right. It'll be more personal. Using the analogy of the, the birth of a live baby, right? Mm -hmm. We don't go to the hospital, have the baby, and say, well, the work is done. You know, the work just begins. Yeah, great. Well, I begin. I think we're beginning to appreciate the, the role that we might play in growth uh, for individual uh, Christians, for sure. Well, let's think about this second level here. Uh, as believers move beyond spiritual infancy, I've put up here that we kind of move into a, a, a phase of spiritual youth, a, a second level of maturity. What the Apostle John calls here in verse 13, young men who have overcome the evil one. John uses a, a Greek term here uh, uh, for have overcome, and it's it has a certain tense to it. It's in what's called the perfect tense, which means we can reach a point in our spiritual development where we have already overcome the evil one, Satan. And this victory, even though it's happened, it's going to have ongoing results in our life. In fact, the tense that John uses here tells us this. Now, the question is, how does this continue, this overcoming of Satan, which represents this growth in spiritual maturity? How uh, does this continue to have ongoing results in our life? What practically does somebody have to be involved in and doing to continue to grow in this way? I want to suggest to you this morning, the only way to overcome Satan is to be strong in the knowledge of Scripture. This is a really crucial part of spiritual development. And notice verse 14 here as we think about that truth. John writes, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And notice, the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Brethren, if you reach this level of maturity, the truth is you're still going to have sin. You're still going to have temptation in your life. But the crucial difference now is that the word has started to take root. Your mind is starting to be transformed because of the preached word, the, the taught word, the personal study of God's word. You begin to know sound doc doctrine. Not just so that you know that doctrine, but that you know sound doctrine well enough that you're starting to be able to recognize error. Okay, you're beginning to resist the enticements, the temptations of the world. You're able to fight vigorously when confronted with that temptation. And the fact is, as Christians mature, 
they begin to be able to understand and to correctly even interpret the Word of God. Now, I don't know about you, when I first started reading God's Word as a new Christian, I don't know that I understood everything I was reading. I was kind of reading for familiarity. It reminds me of my, my uh, work as a, a biologist years ago. When I first encountered the sciences, I don't know that I understood everything perfectly, but I was starting to get the, the lingo down, particularly as I began my life working in the labs. You know, the labs... Uh, in the sciences are full of all kinds of things that are unfamiliar at first. You don't know all the names of the equipment that you use or even how to use it or you don't know all of the lingo. You start reading journal articles from your profession but at first it's like another language and things like that but pretty soon you know all kinds of things are starting to roll off your tongue and you become uh, familiar. Same thing in Christian maturity. As you mature as a spiritual youth, you begin possessing a, a vigorous, even a passionate drive for the truth because your theology is starting to come into focus. It's being shaped by God's Word. You can use the Word to discern the times and the, the trends in our society. You come up against uh, teachings about homosexuality and you think, you know, that doesn't square with what I know of God's Word. You come up with the idea that gender exists on a spectrum and it's just a social construct and you think, you know, that doesn't sound right. I know that in the book of Genesis, uh, Moses recorded recorded God's word, male and female, he created them, right? This is something that's hardwired into us. And so you're beginning to deal with the important issues all around. And you will believe and you'll know and you'll understand what the Bible teaches about the great truths that dominate God's word. So if somebody, say, uh, from the Jehovah's Witness comes to your door and they begin teaching you that uh, uh, Jesus is not God the way that you've learned. He's actually a creator being. You know, you start thinking about that and you think that doesn't square with what scripture's testimony of Jesus is, right? And you're beginning to start to think in Christian terms. You're beginning to be able to refute error when it comes your way. Now, you may not be able to perfectly defend everything yet, but you're starting to get some bones in that building and you're beginning to get some courage. I don't know if any of you have ever had an opportunity where you've defended truth in some way or you've heard something and you thought, that's not true and I know why it's not from God's Word. That can really give you courage. It can give you strength as you stand on firm ground. So this movement to the next level of maturity, it's a very important one. It's a very life-giving one. And I think it's one that's uh, uh, crucial in our development. That's really good. Um, it makes me think of something that Answers in Genesis often teaches when they're thinking about discernment and things like that. They'll say, is a truth, little t truth or whatever that you've heard, is that ultimately rooted in man's word or God's word? And it's just a very simple question that you can ask to think about. So if somebody says, you know, gender exists on a spectrum, uh, it's a social construct. It's not a real thing rooted in DNA or anything like that. You can say, hmm, well, that's a kind of truism. Does that originate from man's word or God's word? What does God's word have to say about gender, for example? And it's kind of a simplistic little tool, but I think it's helpful, right? Because if right away you think, you know, I think that arises from the wisdom of, of humans rather than the wisdom of the word of God, that automatically kind of puts you in a posture where you're going to be a little bit skeptical of that. I mean, you should be really skeptical, right? But I'm just saying, for the spiritual youth, you should pause and say, hmm, I think that's coming from man's wisdom. Now, where does that really originate? Because I don't know any verse that contends that gender is on a spectrum, or uh, I don't know any verse that says it's okay for two men to love one another because love is love, you know? Uh, in a romantic way, I should say. Obviously, there are male friendships in the Bible, Jonathan and David, where there was great love. Uh, but, um, you know, is this man's word or is it God's word? And of course, the emphasis is Carl's rightly putting out, we want to move from I think to the Bible says. And this is why, again, it, consistent exposure to God's word, very, very important. Shall we move on to the third stage of development, spiritual fathers? Um, 
as uplifting as the, the, the Christian life can kind of be for being a young, maturing person in the faith, uh, that's not where our maturing is to end. There is still another stage of development. And John twice in this passage in 1 John 2 identifies this third category of development. He says, I am writing to you fathers in verse 13. And then in verse 14, he repeats, he says, I have written to you fathers. Who are the fathers? Well, there is a clear difference between this last level of maturity and the previous one. Whereas the the spiritual youth up here in our levels of development is excited about pulling his biblical and doctrinal knowledge together, maybe even vigorously applying it to every issue. The spiritual father, the spiritual mother, the man or woman in Christ has a certain sense of rest, a certain sense of tranquility or even depth of character. Now, the reason for that piece is actually repeated in verses 13 and 14. Notice there, John writes, because you know him who has been from the beginning. You know, the apostle, I think, is saying that the most mature believers will begin to have a deeper knowledge of God. When you start thinking in terms of who God is and who God has revealed himself to be, himself to be, that really starts changing the way you think about the world, right? This is not some kind of mystical experience, but it is an understanding of Scripture that becomes deeper and it becomes richer as we progress from just knowing facts and principles about God to really knowing God, knowing God as He's revealed through the words of Scripture. And you know, knowing the Father more intimately involves such things as experiencing answered prayers. Have any of you looked back in your past and thought, I can see how God's been faithful. I can see his answers to my prayers. Well, when you experience that in the maturing process, you begin to realize that there's no doubt that God does hear and answer. And so even if you go through the dark night of the soul, as a mature father, mature mother in the faith, you can look back over the, the, the life that you've lived with God and think, I know right now it's hard to hear his voice, or I know that I have my own personal struggles and doubts because of the trial, but I know he has heard me before, and I know he hears me now. There's wisdom that comes through the trials. Uh, maybe at this point, spiritual fathers and mothers, they've been the people who have experienced enough of life's sufferings and trials, and they know that God is going to be there to sustain and to comfort. Right, so you know God in a deeper way. You've been through many hard things, perhaps, and God has been there all along the way. And so when you hear Jesus' words or the words of Hebrews uh, about Jesus that says that Jesus will never leave you and never forsake you, you can say, boy, I believe that. I know that's true. I know that's true. You've had this experience. And so this is a deeper kind of maturation. You're really at the point where you begin to lose the fear of death. You know, that's a big thing. It's a very big thing to move for the point where you want to hold on to this life with all that you can. With You'll give anything to continue living in this world. When you move beyond that point and maybe beyond the point of fearing that death to thinking, you know what, I'm going home to be with the Lord that I know and love, and that's okay for me you're reaching deeper levels of spiritual maturity. Now, even as I talk about that, you may realize this morning, you know, I'm not there yet, and that's okay. You know, I struggle a little bit with that myself because I still have young children at home. I have a wife to provide for. If the Lord, I found out, uh, permitted me to have cancer this week, I would be asking and bargaining with the Lord. Lord, I, I need some more time. I need to take care of my, you know, I would struggle with that. But I'd like to think that I would come to a point if, if it came to that point that I would, I would be at peace, that I would resolve and trust that God would take care of my family without me. You know, so this is, a, this is a point in our development which you know, you're reaching graduate level intimate knowledge of God uh, in a way. And so spiritual maturity, that is this process that moves believers from being spiritual infants to spiritual youth to spiritual fathers. And only during those experiences in their lives when we walk in the Spirit and we obey 
God's word. Thoughts on that? Would you say that growth is very important in a Christian's life? What is the opposite of growth in a Christian's life? What does a, a Christian's life look like if they're not growing? Stagnant. Stagnant. Yeah, that was the word I was thinking of too, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, stagnant. Well, let's wrap up with a, a reading of 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And what we want to just kind of wrap up with is um, a reminder of kind of the, the key to growth, which is scripture. I've already mentioned this uh, uh, before, but kind of the classic text on the Bible's power, its value, it's important in our lives for maturing comes in 2 Timothy 3 verses 15 through 17. Paul writes there, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, he's speaking to Timothy, of course, um, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. If you notice there in verse 16, there's really four different roles that scripture plays in our lives. And I think this is a real key influence upon us as we mature and we grow in the faith. Uh, just to kind of break these down real quickly as we draw to an end, there is the role of teaching, scripture's role in teaching. Paul says it is profitable for teaching. And, and profitable is a word that kind of focuses on the sufficiency of Scripture. If you're not convinced that Scripture is useful for your growth, if you neglect it, if you don't take it up and let it to be a shaping force in your lives, you're never going to mature really the way that God uh, intends. And the Word, of course, conveys doctrine. It helps us as believers come to understand God's mind and his truth and his principles, his law, his requirements and his commands, all of these things which are foundational for Christian life. And so this important role teaching is that we never could know certain truths about God unless it was revealed to us. You know, I looked up in the night sky last Sunday night. I, I put a, a fire pit out in the backyard and uh, the mosquitoes have started to kind of decrease. And so we can go out there without getting, you'd think as a mosquito biologist, I would have some appreciation. I have absolutely zero appreciation for mosquitoes. I don't know why they're here other than to torment. You know, they are the deadliest animal in the world. More people are killed by insect-borne diseases than uh, mosquito-borne diseases than any other. So they're deadly, deadly. Millions die each year because of them. Anyways, that's not the point. The point is we were talking, uh, we were sitting around this fire pit. And uh, I have one of those astronomy apps on my phone so you can identify stars in the night. And Trinity and Abram love this. So they're like, Dad, where's Jupiter right now? And where's Venus? And and, uh, you know, where's Alpha Centauri and stuff? They, it's cute to hear them say these things. And so we'll find it and things like that. Well, general revelation shows us that God is, that he's powerful, that he's wise, he's orderly. It tells us a lot of things, but it doesn't tell us everything, right? We need to know some things as they're revealed in God's word. And that's where scripture teaches us. Scripture also has a, a, a role in reproving us, right? Once it begins to teach us the truth, it eventually and inevitably reproves certain ideas. It convicts us. It refutes untruth. So I may not want to push against the grain of culture and say, well, you know, gender is a binary thing. God's word says so. I may not want to do that. It might even cost me something in this life. I might lose friends. I might uh, be persecuted. I might have trouble at work or whatever. But if I were to stand against the truth that God created them male and female, scripture would reprove me. It would correct me. It would convict me, right? It would expose sin and refute error. But it would also correct me, right? Scripture's role in correction is mentioned here. When I was in school, some of my favorite teachers were the ones who would grade my papers and my tests. And not only would they mark something wrong, but they would write down 
what the correct answer was or where my answer had gone wrong. I was always really appreciative of that. Now, the teachers that I didn't care for so much, they would just check it wrong. They wouldn't tell you what exactly was wrong, and it left me puzzled sometimes as to what exactly my error was. Well, the Bible is not like the teachers I didn't like, right? It doesn't say uh, you're wrong without giving you the correction. The Bible corrects us, and so it convicts and refutes, and it pulls us back into line. It rebuilds, and it fixes what in my mind is broken. And then notice Scripture's role in training us in righteousness. You know, as God's Word has a role in our growth, it just doesn't leave us with the bare elements of truth, right? We apply it to our lives, and it builds us up in righteousness. If you look at those senior saints, those fathers and mothers over time, you can see changes in their lives, right? They are being molded and trained in righteousness. And this has a practical effect, right? We hear scripture preached during the worship service or taught in Sunday school class, and we apply that to our lives. You know, the next practical phrase of our training in righteousness comes in our daily lives when we interact with uh, people and ideas of the world, and sometimes we need to confront error, right? It has a practical outworking. Um, on a more personal level, you become trained in righteousness as you resist temptation. You know, you begin to understand God's law and His Word and say, you know, I shouldn't do that. And God, of course, in conversion has written that law in our heart, and you begin to listen to the voice of conscience. And so when you allow it to shape you, it's very important. So let's end uh, now with a, a quick story. Uh, years ago, uh, supposedly a young man came to the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates and asked him, Oh, Socrates, will you be my master? And uh, Socrates looked at the young man and he said, Follow me. And he began walking out near the sea. And they walked right into the water. And of course, this young man was pretty eager to be a disciple of Socrates, so he kept following him. And Socrates kept marching into the Aegean, right? Pretty soon they got to a point where the water was right up to their lips. And Socrates turned around and put both of his hands on the young man's head and plunged him underneath the water. Well, the young student there thought, I guess this is all part of the thing. So he was compliant with it, allowing him to be held under the water. But pretty soon he began to spit and sputter and flail and gasp for air. All the while, Socrates there, pretty strong guy, holding him under the water. And soon the young man began blowing large bubbles and he was thrashing like mad. And so finally Socrates took his hands off of his would-be student who popped up to the surface of the water. And of course, as he did so, he's gasping for air spewing water out of his mouth, and the young man frantically asks Socrates, Why did you do that? Why? And Socrates answered him, he said, When you want to learn as much as you wanted to breathe just now, I will be your teacher. When believers want to find and know the truth the way some people look for treasures, of this world. When believers crave the word as passionately as an infant craves milk, they will grow and mature and become like Christ. And so let me end with Joshua 1.8, a fitting summary of our study of spiritual growth this morning. God says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have spiritual success. So the key is to absorb God's word and to live it out in our lives.